Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas lecture series. My name's Richard Eccleston. I'm Professor of Political Science and Director of the Tasmanian Policy Exchange here at the University of Tasmania. Um, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be hosting the first of three forums on the future of work. As a reflection of the institution's deep recognition of the deep history and culture of, island, of the island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of La Truita, Tasmania, the Palawa people, who are the original custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today and who never ceded sovereignty over it. We pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to affirm our commitment and support to the truth-telling process that's underway here in La Truita as a really important step towards treaty. As many of you are aware, the Island of Ideas series commenced in 2020 as a way of keeping our community and ideas connected during a time when we were unable to meet and gather in person. The program continues in 2022 in the hope that we can continue to connect Tasmanians and our community to research um, that's globally significant and ideas and insights into emerging issues. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars and workshops to nurture the ongoing learning of students, alumni and the wider community. These are a really important part of the university's role and why we continue to host forums such as these. We're getting used to um, the Zoom format, but there are a few housekeeping issues that I'd just like to mention. Your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled um, so that our speakers won't be interrupted. But obviously we do encourage participation, particularly from those of you who are tuning in live this evening. Um, and you will be able to ask questions that we will endeavour to respond through, to, through the Q&A function. Also, over the course um, of the forum tonight, we'll be posing some poll questions to get your um, opinion and feedback. And finally, um, this lecture is being recorded for later access on YouTube um, and also the Sound, the Sound Clown, Cloud um, channel. As we know, the economic and employment recovery um, from the COVID-19 pandemic has been remarkably strong. Here in Tasmania, there are four and a half thousand more people in work today than there were prior to the pandemic. And as we saw in the federal budget earlier this week, we're now forecasting um, national unemployment to go down to historical lows of around 3.75%. But based on research we've done here at the University of Tasmania, nationally and internationally, it's also apparent that the nature of work has and will continue to change in a range of significant ways. And this is the first forum in a series of three hosted by the university that's trying to explore and examine these issues and consider how we should as a community respond to them. Tonight, our topic is, is the Home Office Fair, where we discuss the rise of remote and flexible working during the pandemic. I'll ask the question to our panellists, is this pattern likely to be sustained? Who is able to access flexible and remote working? And what are the longer term implications for employment and for the broader community? After Easter, we'll be hosting two additional um, forums as part of the series, where we look at the changing training and skills need associated with the rapid uptake of technology in the workplace what that means for training, what it means for pathways to employment. And then finally, we'll discuss how new patterns of work, migration and settlement will reshape the Tasmanian community and how we can respond to and support that. Now tonight, we're lucky to be joined by um, a wonderful panel um, with broad expertise across a range of industries to share their perspectives and to discuss the future of remote working um, and its implications. And I'd like to briefly introduce um, our three panellists now. Starting with um, Dr. Angela Jackson. Angela um, is a lead economist um, at Equity Economics and Policy and one of Australia's leading economists. 
She's a graduate of the University of Tasmania. And earlier in her career, um, she was an economist at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and was the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Federal Finance Minister during the global financial crisis. More recently at Equi Equity Economics, um, Angela's led a number of research projects, particularly supporting the New South Wales government's um, response um, to COVID-19 and the associated recovery process. She's done really extensive work on the importance of social and community housing in terms of the economic recovery, certainly a set of issues that we're grappling with here in Tasmania. And of uh, particular relevance to tonight's topic, she's done a major report on the gender impacts um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so welcome, um, Angela, and thank you so much for taking out time in a, in a busy budget week. Um, you can see on screen um, Adrian Vaconi, um, the CEO um, of the Tasmanian Council of Social Service, TASCOS. As many of you are aware, Adrian's a very experienced and respected community sector leader, um, a tireless advocate um, to ensure that all Tasmanians can access high quality service um, to improve their life chances. Um, before the TASCOS role, Adrian was the CEO of Volunteering Australia um, nationally. Um, so thank you, Adrian, for joining us. And last, but by no means least, um, Tara Howe um, is a tourism um, entrepreneur, the founding director um, of the Blue Derby Pods Ride Experience, um, a multi-award winning um, tourism operator uh, and general um, go-getter. Um, she's the co-founder of the really innovative Change Overnight um, Hotel, um, in Launceston, which really is pushing the frontiers of ethical and sustainable tourism experiences. I'm not sure whether I should be advertising, but if you haven't been to the Change Overnight Hotel, uh, please do. She's also um, involved in a number of leadership roles on the Tourism Industry Council of Tasmania, and she was recently appointed to the Governing Council of the University of Tasmania. So thank you, Tara. Now, to get um, to kickstart our conversation, I've asked each of our panellists to, starting with Angela, um, to start the conversation by reflecting on the shift to remote and flexible work that we've um, experienced during the pandemic. Perhaps share their views about that question about the extent to which it will be sustained and will become a normal part of work in some careers and professions and also um, how we need to start responding to that as a community and how it's impacted on industries and sectors of the community that they're familiar with. So I think that's enough from me. I'd like to hand over to you, Angela. Oh, thank you very much, Richard, and thanks for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the lands where I'm calling from, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Now, I've been asked tonight to do something that economists aren't very good at, which is talk without slides, which means I don't have graphs to refer to. So apologies as I look down at my numbers, because normally I just have them up there on the screen. Um, so let's just go back in time a little bit to the start of the pandemic and when it hit and what we saw happen. So we sort of saw through two things, really, two main trends happen. One was a lot of people lost employment very quickly um, and predominantly they were casual, insecure workers. Um, there were a lot, uh, the majority of them were women and young women in particular were hit really, really hard without post-school qualifications. Then there was another segment that started working from home. And in fact, we saw the rates of people working from home hit 50% in Australia. Now they were more likely to obviously keep their jobs, professional jobs. Um, and that's really the trend I guess we're talking about tonight. But I wanna talk a little bit about what's then happened to that first trend. So we've seen employment grow again. And as the you know treasurer this week outlined, it's an amazing, miraculous recovery. But we are still seeing some of those trends come through. So for example, and this is where I'm gonna look down because I normally have a graph showing you this, for people who don't have any post-school qualifications and for women in particular, employment levels are still 2% below where they were at the start of the pandemic. So they haven't fully recovered. Whereas what we're seeing is people with diplomas and bachelor degrees that their employment's actually up 7% on pre-pandemic levels and those who are certificate or above up 3%. So what we've seen is a real shift for women in particular towards those more educated women have actually tended to do quite well out of the pandemic and their participation levels are actually higher than they were before. 
But for those women without an education, things are still pretty tough. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind when we hear this sort of glowing picture as well. There are some divergence there in terms of particularly people with different educational backgrounds. Now, the question we're asking tonight is around, well, what's the future of work? And it sort of ties into that, I think, quite nicely, whereby we have had this move to working from home. And I think that probably does underpin, particularly in states that experience like me, unfortunately, in Victoria, extended lockdowns. We have seen this shift to working from home, which has opened up new opportunities. And one more stat for you, we are seeing quite a big difference between those states that did experience those long lockdowns and those that didn't. So if we look at Tasmania, for example, and female participation, it's actually dropped since the start of the pandemic by 0.8%. Whereas nationally, the picture is it's up 0.8%, which is driven by those lockdown states. Um, and I think it's an area where we haven't researched yet, but I think it's quite interesting that, you know, in those states where working from home really was normalised during the pandemic, and we had to do it for a very, very, very long time, <laughs> if we can say that. And so businesses, it really has become business as usual and people aren't going back to the office in the same way, that that may well be leading to this lift in female participation because particularly amongst more educated women, because suddenly job opportunities that weren't there before, that you know they would have had to go into an office or they would have had to travel a long way, suddenly they can do it from home and they can do it more flexibly. Um, and that's a really interesting, I think, dynamic as part of this and how places like Tasmania in particular, which maybe didn't have that transformative experience, and I know that that's a lucky thing, and don't worry, I was very jealous <laughs> during the last two years of my Tasmanian friends, um, but that having not gone through that transition, that your economies are going to look potentially quite a lot different um, and how that then plugs back into what has happened in Victoria and New South Wales, which obviously do in some ways dominate and lead the nation's economy. And I think that's an interesting dynamic and something there's going to be some great different diff analysis coming out of this pandemic, that's for sure. And I think it will be really interesting to see as this data comes through, what is driving that difference in the participation? And is it this flexibility, particularly for more educated women, where suddenly there are job opportunities available for them? Just one more quick thing, because otherwise I'm going to go over my five minutes. Um, is it all positive? Well, no, it's not. So the thing to really keep in mind is that while working from home for women does open up these new opportunities, there are new ways of working whereby women may well be find themselves in certain roles and pigeonholed into those roles. They may be, by not going into the work, they may be missing mentoring opportunities, for example, missing those networking opportunities. And it is going to be really important in that context for businesses to think very carefully about how they analyse data, about how they're managing their workforce to ensure that those discrepancies between men and women, which were already evident before the pandemic, don't become more entrenched. Uh, and we don't see a situation where it's men who are going into the office and women who are staying at home missing out on those opportunities, those casual opportunities for management opportunities and new leadership opportunities. Now I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'm going over my five minutes. Um, another thing probably economists do quite often, keep talking um, and throw back to Richard. <laughs> Thanks so much, Angela. You definitely don't need um, PowerPoints. That was brilliant. And a, a number of themes I'm sure we'll return back to. But I might hand over to Adrian now to her reflections on um, how remote and flexible working has impacted on the social and community care um, sector and industry. As we know, one of the largest employers uh, in the state and clearly one of the most important. So, Adrian, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And it's great to get um, Angela's perspective at that national level because I, I will kind of hone it down into a particular industry within Tasmania and what we sort of observed happened here over the last kind of couple of years. So TASCOS is the Tasmanian Council of Social Services, as Richard mentioned, and our role is to represent the community services industry. And we're also, our role is to change and challenge the systems that create poverty, disadvantage and inequality. So when I talk about the community services industry, what I'm meaning is a whole range of sectors, if you like. So we're talking about disability, we're talking about aged care, education and care, things like housing, mental health, alcohol, tobacco and other drugs. And within that industry in, in Tasmania, there's around 17,000 paid workers and we're supported by about 35,000 volunteers. So it's a significant uh, workforce. 
In fact, it's about 7% of the overall workforce in Tasmania. And also what we know, and just sort of tying in a bit to, to what Angela was talking about um, with the impact on women, is that within community services, 82% of the staff, of the uh, employees are female, which is high, much, much higher, obviously, than the, uh, the average of the general population, which is about 47% of the, popular, of the um, employment rates are, are female, of the workforce as a whole. Diverse range of organisations and roles. We've got CEOs, we've got um, strategic project managers, educators, family support workers, you know, chefs, admin people. And by far the biggest percentage um, of that workforce is in ageing, disability and the carer sectors. So it's about 55%. So the impacts of COVID um, and that lockdown that we had, and, and more generally being isolated from the rest of the country in the way that we were when the border was closed, um, really were significant. And I think they continue to be significant. We're certainly not out of it yet. Um, what we saw was that the demand for services within community services industry significantly increased. And the complexity uh, of, of issues that people were presenting with also really changed. So what that meant was that services needed to really adapt um, and change the way that they delivered services to Tasmanians. Um, so some, of course, some of those roles that are in frontline care, are those sort of very sort of face-to-face -face roles that require physical support are roles that can never be um, done online. There's always gonna be an element of those within the industry. Organisations like Taskos, for example, which is more of a back-end kind of organisation, we were quickly able to, to um, work from, from home and um, adapt really quickly. There was sort of a section within community services industry, and I'm thinking particularly sort of areas where there's like counselling, social work, uh, family support workers, for example, that were then able to move a lot of their services online and deliver them online. And that, that had a real impact um, both positive and negative, I think, both for staff, but also for clients um, who were receiving those services. So I'm not sure if you are aware, but here in Tasmania, we have the lowest levels of digital inclusion in the country, um, in every area, whether it's about accessibility, having a device, having digital literacy skills, we're, we are at the bottom. Um, so I guess I just wanted to kind of contextualise the way that we responded and the impact it had in that way. So from that sort of digital divide. What we know is that there was a continuity of care that services were able to provide. And I think that that was something that we were really pleased about. But, and it also had a flow on effect. So some people who weren't actually able to access services previously were now, particularly those people from rural and regional areas, were now able to access the services for the first time, which was fantastic. But what for workers became an issue was um, those issues around digital inclusion. But it was also, um, in order to be able to deliver a service from your home, you need a suitable space so you need to make sure you've got a, a room that's private where you can have those sort of confidential conversations, which was obviously really challenging when pe uh, parents were start trying to educate children from home. But you also need good access to the internet, you need office equipment, and a high level of both digital literacy and general literacy as well. So the delivery of services then became very limited by digital inclusion and the care requirements of the consumer. And I guess, I guess what I just wanted to say is it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all um, situation. And I guess from the other side of the equation, what we saw was for clients, some, as I said earlier, accessing services for the very first time, but for others, really struggling to be able to maintain the care and support um, that they needed because they either didn't have um, access to the internet, they didn't have um, a device, or they were just not confident using that sort of digital platform. What we saw was some clients then stopped using services altogether, but then for others, it was an absolute lifeline that got them through that period. So I think it's, it's interesting as we move into that the sort of year three of COVID, you know, I think there's some real, that the impacts are still quite uncertain um, and unknown. And it's likely that I think the, the industry will continue to sort of reposition itself, not just at the state level, but also nationally, as particularly as we respond to that increased 
the demand for services. Great, thank you so much, Adrian. I mean, we know COVID was a huge disruption with a whole range of complicated impacts and particularly so in terms of the community service industry, given the diverse nature and broad responsibilities. Um, one thing that's already clear is you know, it highlights that issue of digital inclusion, which is not, it's, TASCOS has long been advocating um, to, to address as a policy priority, but it's not just about the technology, it's also about education. So clearly Absolutely. an agenda there. I think it really laid bare that issue in a way that we perhaps weren't expecting. Mm. Now, Tara, I'd like to hand over to you in terms of your reflections on the impacts, and we know that they were pretty significant on tourism and hospitality, but also um, given the nature of your business, the impact on, on work in, in regional Tasmania. Over to you, Tara. Thank you. Um, what a great topic to be discussing with some fantastic panellists. So thank you for having me. Um, as Richard, you just said, I think I'll focus, although um, we all probably talk about this issue um, all night, on that tourism industry and hospitality industry and the skills and labour shortages in regional areas. So in relation to that first one, the tourism and hospo industry, uh, everyone would be very aware um, incredible couple of years for our industry, uh, absolutely roller coaster to say the least. Um, but on reflection, I think one thing that we, in relation to this topic, is that the tourism and hospitality industry has always had a flexible workforce. And it's been one of the benefits of the tourism and hospitality industry, is why people are drawn in many ways because because of the hours, basically work you know twenty four hours. So there's options for flexibility there. Um, but I think what the pandemic has really highlighted, which is actually some similar themes that Adrian you just talked about, is that there are really two cohorts in the tourism and hospitality industry, and that is service-based workers and uh, those that are behind the scenes. And so those ones that are service, you know, um, housekeeping, front of house, um, waiters, waitressing, guides, uh, there was no option for work from home. They had to get out there and do their jobs. And so then there was become a divide. And if flexible work is being seen as a positive or a benefit, um, and in the pandemic case, definitely safer, um, the industry had a real um, divide in place. And so I think it's gonna be really interesting to see as we come out of the pandemic now and whether we ad adopt more flexible work, if that divide continues and it's seen as a positive or negative for the industry. Um, where I think it will go, I'm not sure yet, but that's something that I'm observing um, in the industry. In relation to regional Tasmania and um, skills and labour shortages, I think this is a really interesting topic that probably um, every, everyone on the panel could unpack a little bit further. Um, but from what I see is there are some potential benefits for flexible working for the regional community and there's potential threats as well. Um, automatically, we can say there's an opportunity for people um, potentially who want to live regionally to then get a, um, a career or a job um, in a place that they wouldn't have in the past. And I think we'll all know of stories of people who are now living at the seaside, working their um, corporate life jobs somewhere um, and good on them. And so there, that is a benefit and that's a really exciting thing that's potentially coming out of the pandemic for regional areas. Um, and in addition to that, there's also regional areas are having opportunity potentially to uh, recruit people who they maybe wouldn't have been able to in the past because of flexible work arrangements. And obviously um, going into your topic, Angela, people maybe who um, would want to be working from home more, they have this opportunity to contribute in regional communities. So there's actually some real opportunities, I think, um, when it comes to those regional communities and the home office environment. So I think I'm going to keep my two topics to there for now and I, we can unpack them further, I know, probably in the QAs as well. Great. Thank you, Tara. And I know that you're beaming in from Derby uh, tonight and we glitched there for a second that shows some of the, 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 the challenges of, of uh, remote working or online access for, for, from remote communities. But I'm no, sorry about that. I'm sorry no, about no, that. No, no, we, we, it, it was perfect. <laughs> I can also see that a number of really uh, interesting questions um, are coming in from the audience. So um, thank you for those. We'll try to get to those in a minute. I guess one broad question, I guess, for, for Tara and Adrian is both of your sectors, both tourism and hospitality um, and community services industry um, are large employers. 
but they have struggled um, in terms of uh, in terms of la labour supply and workforce and retention. The question is, given the fact that big parts of both of those sectors still involve that personal interaction and face-to-face -face contact, whether it's hospitality or, or care. Has COVID actually, and this trend towards remote working and flexible working actually intensified or exacerbated some of those, um, some of those challenges? Who would you like to start, Richard? I'm happy to. <laughs> the floor is yours, Tara. Look, I think it's a really good question. And from um, the tourism and hospitality industry, I think it's really important to note that uh, the issue of workforce and labour isn't new for us. Pre-pandemic, it was an issue as well, and it's been absolutely given a big explanation mark um, now we've gone through this pandemic. And so I think uh, it's, it's basically the top of our list of the priorities that we need to address. And things that um, we're talking about in the industry level and I know um, at a state level and nationally are, you know, looking at our, our pay rates, obviously the, the pay rates are going, it's an incredible landscape to be in. Tourism and hospitality probably doesn't um, pay enough and, and that's, that's the reality. So we have to discuss that. Um, the restructuring of our industry, it's, it's very much seen as a, um, you know, short-term career in many many instances, but in fact, in other countries around the world, it's not. It's it's actually a real job, and it should be seen as a real job because it is. Um, and overall, with that, which I know a number of states are doing in Tassie, doing a really job, in my opinion, is actually just rebranding that industry to bring messages like that forward. So, yeah, I think my my commentary is that it's not a new issue. It's just been absolutely given the exclamation mark here and here because of because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's 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 been actually there was the interesting relationship between hospitality and tourism and community services during that that period. I think what we saw was that with the borders closing, a lot of people were moving from um, hospitality and tourism into the community services industry. Um, I think that, and, and and in some instances, actually, I don't think they've gone back. I think that I think they've stayed. But I think one of the really interesting things that happened um, during that. COVID period was that um, a lot of people were questioning, you know, what are we, what are we doing here? What's the world all about? What's my purpose? Um, and I think that, um, that that was a really kind of interesting time and an interesting synergy for the community services because obviously we are the for-purpose sector and, and it's, you know, it's a real opportunity for people to actually live according to their purpose and, and make a real difference. I think Years ago, I remember we used to talk a lot about the different generations and what generations needed and were motivated by in the workplace. And we used to talk about Gen Y. You know, I think it was they used to we used to say they work to live, not live to work, like older generations. But I think that's actually now something that we can see right across the generations. Um, you know, that we're, we were really reminded during that time about what we're not just people who go to work. That we're we want to have a fulfilling life and and make a difference. We want to actually also have that sort of that work balance, work life balance. So I think that um, what we know in community services is last year we released a community services industry plan, and our first priority in that plan is that we need actually know we need another four thousand new roles in our industry until twenty twenty four just to meet current and projected needs. That's a significant number of jobs that we need to create, and one of the things that we We'll be doing as part of that is a recruitment campaign. So we want people to see this industry as an industry of choice where you can come here, there's meaningful, meaningful things to do, there are career pathways, um, and that it's a it's a good place, it's a good place to work. So it's going to be a really interesting time to see how things unfold from here. I mean, on, on that point, Adriana, there's a really good question from um, Tanya. Um, that she's posed about whether employers in Tasmania will have to offer work from home um, arrangements to remain competitive in a, in a tight labour market, but also plays into what workers, employees' preferences are and what they value in terms of the work-life balance. I might throw to you, Angela, I mean, in terms of your view of the national kind of trends, I mean, are employers in some industries and occupations almost being forced 
um, to provide flexible and support flexible working arrangements, which I guess is part of the, the forces that are kind of, they're going to see that it continue into the future. Yeah, look, I mean, and, and this is anecdotal, um, but I, I think it's certainly true that perhaps coming out of the first lockdowns in particular, and, you know, I've lived through a lot, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so like, which lockdown are we talking about? It's actually the second lockdown yeah, I'm in Victoria because the first one, obviously, we all had, and then we got a second one um, in 2020. Um, there was a big push to get workers back on site, probably full-time, um, and there was a bit of resistance to that. And certainly speaking to people, managers in particular, they were trying to explain to the senior executives, look, we have to provide this flexibility because that's what these younger workers, everybody wants. So the model really at the moment seems to be you work from home two or three days and you go into the office maybe Wednesdays and Thursdays and, and possibly a Tuesday. Um, and But then coming out of obviously the second year of lockdown. <laughs> Um, there seems to be a greater acceptance of that. Um, and it's also a tighter labour market. So, you know, employers have to be attractive at the moment. Otherwise, employees are going to shift jobs. Uh, and a lot of workers have also moved, um, you know, in Victoria and Melbourne in particular, we've had a huge exodus to the regions. Um, and so people simply can't come back in, you know, and it's, you know, they might be now living an hour and a half, two hours out of Melbourne. And so the idea of commuting every day is simply not workable. Uh, so it's certainly, I think, in the Victorian case, it's going to be situation normal. I guess the question, does that then permeate? Like what happens to the, the national labour market? Um, and are there, you know, opportunities, for example, you know, uh, firms on the mainland poaching talented staff from Tasmanian firms and you can work remotely and just come up to Melbourne once every couple of weeks. Those sort of arrangements. Um, in some ways, it's that real mobility of labour, right? Like it's a huge efficiency gain potentially, but it does also make life potentially harder for Tasmanian businesses. I mean, I think practically speaking in the Tasmanian instance, I mean, commute times, I mean, I know you guys think you have traffic jams, but commute times simply aren't the same issue. You know, like you can get, you know, from one part of Hobart to the other quite quickly. So those sort of issues, and perhaps it's not going to be the demand from workers um, in the Tasmanian instance, but certainly I think from an employer perspective, you, you probably do need to be thinking about do I need to have this old style view of how working works or do we actually need to move with the times here and provide much more flexible working? Um, and I'm not sure what is happening on the ground in Tasmania, whether employers are more open to that or whether they've gone, no, nah, I want you back in the office. Because, you know, for some managers in particular, if they don't have visuals on their workers, they can get quite nervous about productivity. But I think the evidence seems to be coming out of the pandemic that productivity has gone up and if anything the concern I think it's one of the questions um, in the Q&A is there is a degree that people are working more hours and longer hours and actually productivity has gone up that people the the real risk is burnout where people are working too hard because they don't necessarily have that delineation between work and home um, that they perhaps had previously so look it's a very interesting and changing time and I think you know, in terms of those labour market dynamics about what it actually means, it opens up huge potential um, in terms of where people work and where people's skills can be used. Um, but it also obviously presents a lot of challenges for businesses in that really, in that competition for workers, particularly skilled workers. Yeah, we might be over two years into the, the, the pandemic, but um, it's still, you know, uncertain in terms of the way these things are going to play out. And I can see a number of sort of questions related to that sort of theme in the chat about, you know, will this lead to you know, fundamentally redesigning houses? Will it lead to growth in kind of shared office spaces? And, you know, will it lead to different patterns of, of settlement and migration? And there are issues that we certainly plan to explore in greater detail um, after, after Easter, because that's going to have profound implications on, region, on regions around the country and beyond, and certainly here in Tasmania, we're starting to see some of the early evidence of that. An interesting question around, so we can see the kind of divide between professional and knowledge workers who have probably been benefited from the shift to remote working and, and, and access to a greater pool of jobs. I'd like to discuss, and it's in the, the chat, this issue about what it means for um, 
younger and less experienced um, workers and also for women uh, 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 and other groups? And how do you establish a career and professional connections online? Do you see an open to anyone? I mean, do you see that as, as being, a, yeah, being a challenge? I, I think it is. And I think, um, you know, certainly, um, and again, this is anecdotal, so I'm sorry, but this is just talking to people uh, around Melbourne. It was younger workers who really wanted to get back into the office. So particularly those living alone and those that felt that they weren't necessarily learning and they weren't in that learning environment. Um, so there are going to have to be different approaches, I think, for different workers, but then people still want the flexibility. And so the, the problem, I guess, for em employers is, so I have all this office space, but you're only going to come in two or three days and you just want to come in and, and network effectively and then go home um, maybe to do more detailed work work on the other two days. But it's going to have to be that sort of flexible model, I think, um, and particularly in the current labour market where, you know, the shortages are real and if you want to attract the staff and particularly the young, talented staff, you're going to have to offer that. But for employers, I think it is that time, it's a difficult time for some businesses and I think those that transition really well um, mm. and offer what workers want are going to do really well, basically. Yeah. But those that are slow to adapt are going to struggle um, to stay competitive in the in you know in the labor market and therefore in terms of what they're necessarily producing and if you think yes yeah, so I think some of those older mentalities are not going to survive in this environment um, so then... I mean Angela mentioned you know productivity and we're certainly Seen a lot of research and anecdotally I've, I've heard that people say productivity has been very positive during this period nobody's sort of worried that people are not performing uh, when they're working from home but I guess I just my kind of sense is that um, we need to sort of step this out and and it's almost like test it out as well and I think that we still haven't yet understood the impact that extended periods of working from home could have on organisational culture. Um, and I think particularly for bringing new people onto a team, you know, I think in, in our industry, we're very values based. It's very hard to, I think part of why we come to work is to connect with each other and feel that sort of sense of belonging and achieve things together. I think it's much harder um, if you don't have those established relationships already with staff to then sort of, uh, do that as, uh, together so I think it's I, to, to me I just think you know this but it's about balance and it's about testing out new models and new ways of doing things rather than sort of jumping to the to the end point and making in, in, uh, huge changes. I might just add um, two perspectives and then one of them is probably going to open up a can of worms but um, the younger point I think is something that needs to be really considered and I'm sure it is in other parts of Australia but um, you know, when you're training someone who's young, they really do need a lot more work when you're training someone who's been in, the, in, in any industry for 10 years. And so um, having resources and tools on how to actually encourage young people to pick up a phone or how you're going to be training them from, you know, if there's that flexible option in place, I think that that, that would have to be there because, you know, reflecting on, uh, you know, if I was starting in the corporate world and I didn't have someone I could sit next to and ask a billion questions to begin with, that would be really hard. Um, and I think that also, um, although I'm not disagreeing at all with, you know, adapting to a flexible workplace is really important. Um, I had the privilege of sitting on the Gender Equality Tasmania Board for a number of years. And one of my final years was the first year of the pandemic. And the statistics of um, our call rate for family vi violence um, when all of this hit was absolutely terrifying. And that's always in the back of my mind with workplaces making something like this compulsory. I think we're using the word option here, but I just have to say that because, um, you know, not everyone's home environment is conducive to working. That's a, a really good point. And, you know, I think one thing that this discussion is, is really highlighting, uh, there are significant equity implications yeah, a really good question from Stuart in the chat. You know, the fact that a lot of frontline care roles, um, you know, can't be delivered flexibly and, you know, will this increase, you know, the, the, the professional divide between care workers and knowledge workers, but also cuts across a whole range of domains, doesn't it? It's really the sense it's making the jobs market more competitive. So people who are empowered 
can, uh, you know, can exploit um, that younger workers. And it seems, you know, the, the emerging evidence is that a lot of women's caring responsibilities um, haven't gone away. So they're, they're working more at home, but none of the caring responsibilities um, have diminished. So there's a, there's a really significant um, burden, burden there. What, I mean, we need to keep a watching brief on this. I mean, what practical steps in terms of policy or as a community or as employers do you think should be a priority, you know, here in Tasmania as we think about the social and economic recovery from the pandemic? And you've done so much um, policy work, uh, Angela. I mean, what are, what, what are, you know, what are some of the, the, the priorities that you and your colleagues at Equity Economics have been promoting? It's actually impact economics now, but that's all right. Um, uh, I think that the important thing really is, well, and I'm going to say this because I'm an economist, is data. So we need to, and I think workplaces need to really be surveying their staff, really getting that feedback, understanding what is going on, what their needs are, um, and really proactive management practices. Um, I think just recognition that this is a huge transition and time of change. And that needs real change management and active change management. Now, it was forced on us, so it's not something that, you know, we've pro you know normally you do change management when you want to do a, a system redesign. But this is a huge change in the way that we're working and the systems that need to be in place. So I think data is really important. I think thinking about training your managers, like what other things to look out for, um, you know, because mental health is going to be an issue. Burnout is going to be an issue um, and getting that balance right. So, for me, that's really what we need. And obviously, I would say the same in terms of at a national level. You know, the data coming out of the ABS has been good. They're very innovative, but there's still a lot of things. It's, you know, the way in which the data is released and the timing of that data, it can be quite difficult. For example, it'd be great if the census data could come out a bit earlier. Um, so we could really see what was the impact of the pandemic on different groups um, and, and those sort of things, because the delay until next year, you know, is a long time and it means we can't start research. Um, but we just need to keep, I think, that idea of a watching brief and that understanding that something very big has happened here um, and it is going to have positive impacts, but there are going to be negative impacts. And the inequality of those impacts is really important because we do talk a lot and it is, you know, higher educated people are probably going to do better in this environment. But there are a big group of people who don't have those level, that level of education or digital knowledge to necessarily benefit um, and those for those that group of people it is going to be a lot more difficult in this new environment and the options aren't going to be as great so I think just a real focus on that and thinking about well what can we do in terms of educating what can we do in terms of the training um, and really targeting those groups in particular and I'll say again you know coming out of the pandemic it really it was so clear that it was women without further education who really got hit hard um, and particularly the young women. So really focusing on those groups, I think, in terms of the policy response. And, you know, often the training uh, money that goes in the economy, the apprenticeships, don't focus necessarily on those female industries. There was some money in the budget, which was good, but predominantly it goes towards more male jobs. I think, you know, thinking about apprenticeships and those sort of uh, policies in the care sector um, and expanding those programs is also a really good way to go. Well, thanks, Angela. And I know from the detailed work that, um, that we did here at the university uh, with colleagues in a business school, you know, highlighted one of the few segments of the Tasmanian workforce where employment didn't recover um, were women under 30. Um, and, and, and that's across, across regions and, and, and industries. Um, you can see now that there's a, um, a poll there in terms of what you um, as audience members, those of you viewing live, um, think about the, the outlook um, for, for the future of work. One, before I go to you, um, Tara and Adrian, about um, priorities, an interesting idea um, that's come up in the, in the discussion in a couple of points is we know that um, there's going to be a, a shift towards you know, regional and flexible work, but actually having designated places to work in the regions. You know, it could be an opportunity. And we're seeing some businesses setting up sort of office sharing um, facilities, but in a context like Tasmania, I mean, is there a role for 
government, perhaps even, you know, the university providing, you know, regional hubs where people can do their flexible and remote working, but have that kind of collegial contact and have the right you know, infrastructure. An interesting idea is very interested where you think that might work um, up in the Northeast, uh, Tara. Do we Look, need a, a regional workplace uh, in, uh, in, in St Helens or, or something like that? Yeah, look, I think it's a really interesting idea, um, you know, drawing back on the point I just recently made about safety at home. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Adrian, you've talked a lot about community, which workplace brings, which I completely agree with as well. Um, that is um, potentially could help mitigate um, these risks that we're talking about. Um, and of course, um, it just gives that, it, it can't, yeah, as I said, it could mitigate those risks. So definitely, definitely an idea that could be considered um, for regional areas and others as well. And I'm sure there's probably already pilots taking place across Australia that we're not aware of. And I think um, you know, inevitably it takes time to respond when we're talking about you know, developers or commercial landlords or government. I can see a comment in the, the chat from, from Jen that apparently um, the Tasmanian Coordinator General's Office released a report saying that you know, we know that there's a housing crisis, but there's also a real shortage of office space um, in, in central Hobart, unlike in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, <laughs> so, you know, surely um, there are opportunities to utilise that space you know, more, more efficiently. Adrian, what do you think should be a, a, a priority? I mean, we've touched on the, the digital, digital in inclusion. I think, um, I mean, I, I, I would agree with Angela that I think this is about a watching brief. I think we, we're all quite keen for this COVID thing to end, but, you know, I think that we do need to, to step this one out. I mean, I, I think it really requires us to do a really thorough risk assessment, and that's an ongoing process. It's not something that we can just do and then, and then put on the shelf. I think that there are real, a number of risks that need to be monitored during this, the, what, that we're, as we're establishing this sort of new way of working. I'm just sort of reflecting on um, ACOS did some uh, research last year and um, what they found was that, the, you know, the increased amount of paid work, uh, unpaid work that happened when people were working from home. So people perform, who, who did 32.9 paid hours, then on average did an additional six unpaid hours um, a week. So I think those are the sort of things that we need to be monitoring. The other thing is, and it's just an example that we had uh, from one of our members who runs a family violence service, um, who was actually uh, doing some sessions from home with clients while she was also um, homeschooling her children. And what she observed was that children were exposed to some of those conversations that they would normally not hear and just how she had then brought the workplace into her home. So I just think it's not about us just launching into this new way. It's about us monitoring. And, and as, as Angela said, it's the watching brief. But I think it's also, it's about asking staff, what do they need? Everybody needs different things. For some people, I remember when we got back into the office in June, 2020, some people were just so relieved to be here. And some people really did not want to come back. You know, it boots some people um, and not others. Um, but the other thing is, I think, is just really good solid policies. Um, and that's about engaging people in developing those policies, your staff in developing those policies and, and implementing them and continually reviewing them um, as well. And I think the other thing is, is, I think, as Angela also mentioned, but is training and education. So we're just always sort of coming, keeping up to date and reviewing what we're doing. Thanks, Adrian. A really good comment in the chat, highlighting the fact how everyone's needs and preferences are different with um, a, 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 a listener saying that um, you know, working from home was a godsend because otherwise they would have a one and a half hour commute and they also had caring responsibilities. So, you know, it was an option which um, clearly works well for them. And, you know, that's kind of counter to you know, some of um, the discussion tonight is that um, we know with our housing crisis in Tasmania and indeed around the country is that, um, you know, it, it's those who are younger um, and, and less wealthy um, who are forced to move, you know, further and live further and further out and often away from work um, and services. So that's significant um, there. 
just looking at the poll results, um, and particularly for those of you viewing this uh, later, um, with the question about whether the pandemic has increased or decreased professional opportunities, it's very much um, split. Around 20% say it's increased, a little under 20% say it's decreased, um, with the majority saying it hasn't had a, um, had a clear impact. So again, it's going to have different impacts different communities, different industries, different, uh, different occupations. Um, so we do need to have that you know, really kind of nuanced response. I think one thing we collectively need to push back against is this idea that, as Angela clearly pointed out, that you know, the jobs market is strong, um, but it has fundamentally changed. And we can't assume that we, that we, that we don't need to be um, vigilant um, and responsive. Question maybe for, for you, Tara, from the uh, from the for, for, from viewers. Do you think there's particular cultural resistance to work from home in Tasmania? Uh, in short, yes, I do. <laughs> Look, I think uh, for two reasons. Um, Tasmania obviously has not had anywhere as much of that. Uh, experience that Angela's spoken to a lot tonight. So we, um, you know, it's only short lockdowns and um, minimal time really being at home compared to many others. Um, and uh, secondly, we do still have, and I hate to use this word, but a very old school or blokey culture, which does reinforce this, um, you know, we have to be there, we have to have that connection, all that kind of stuff, which is the opposite to what flexible work is, um, you know, suggesting. Um, so yes, in, in short, that's my answer. But I mean, I think um, reflecting my answer to the last two questions, I really was just thinking to myself, you know, there's this cultural problem, but throughout the pandemic, what I feel like has, you know, we're talking about flexible work, we're talking about, um, you know, this, this, this problem that's come up, but what is this major thing that's coming out? It's that women potentially are not getting again, we're getting the short, you know, we're getting the short straw again. And you know, is this flexible work like the squeaky wheel is the bigger issue here? What we need to be has our priorities actually just, you know, gender equity. Um, yeah, thank you for nodding your head. <laughs> so yeah, look, I'm answering two questions in one here, but I feel yeah, I think we have a bigger, bigger problem to be talking about. Mm. And it's really perhaps reinforced or exacerbated some of the inequalities in the labour market. And some interesting comments again um, on the chat. Um, you know, what does this mean for um, neuro neurodiverse uh, workers um, and members of our community? What does it mean for migrant workers and um, workers from a CALD or non-English non speaking um, you know, background. Um, you know, these, are, you know, these, are, they, these are real challenges that we need to, to grapple with. Andrew, have you done any, any work on, in terms of the, I mean, you've done a mountain of work around some of the gender and professional differences. What about um, workers from culturally um, diverse backgrounds? Um, I mean, this is one of the things around, you know, what the statistics will tell us at the moment. We don't have those breakdowns in terms of what it has meant we know certainly however during the pandemic that yes migrant women in particular I think it was actually phenomenal at the peak in Victoria it was 40 percent reduction uh, non-English speaking background migrant women in Victoria the drop and again you know it comes down to the type of work it was in, it's insecure work it's casual work it's easy to lay off um, those workers so there was a huge drop but they did actually the, those migrant women came back very strongly um, in the recovery. So, you know, there's, I guess, swings and roundabouts there. Um, I think, but it is interesting to think about what it will mean, you know, for people from non-English speaking backgrounds. Again, I, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be a huge impediment. Obviously, there are benefits of being in the office, but I think likewise, when we're talking about you know, the, the people that benefit from this working from home environment are probably more educated workers. Um, probably some of those, uh, I guess, barriers are not going to be necessarily as great, but I think we do need to be careful. And it's again, where the data is really important that we have it. 
Um, and just picking up on Tyra's point about the, the gender equity and what the bigger picture is here, which is, you know, what the pandemic taught us was that it's women who care, um, it's women in insecure work and low paid jobs. And I think there's somebody here saying, are there really male and female jobs? Well, yeah, there are, you know, there really are industries that are completely dominated by females where four out of five workers are female and they're low paid and they're insecure work. Um, and so while we might celebrate, you know, record levels of female participation in the workforce, and that is great, they're in the low paid industries, they're in the insecure jobs, and that's not something to celebrate. Um, and that's why women, for the brunt of the pandemic, it wasn't just the sectors they were in, it was also the nature of their employment. So they are the broader things that we do need to address. And, you know, at the moment, neither political party is necessarily addressing in terms of the reforms that they're looking at, particularly around the pay, you know, in aged care here in Victoria, again, another lesson, you know, our second wave was driven by insecure work, you know, and, and, it, and if those aged care workers had have had one job that was secure in one aged care um, facility, we would have had nowhere near the number of deaths and we wouldn't have been locked down for an extra four months. Um, and that was the price of that insecure work. Um, but that's a price that those workers pay, you know, every day and every week when they get sick um, and when they're trying to deal with those, um, those issues that they have to deal with every day. But it's just that as a community, we all had to then, you know, very much deal with it. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Clearly a lot of the challenges and inequalities in the labour market and persist. Um, and if there are productivity gains and, and cost savings associated with flexible work, you know, how can we, uh, you know, how can that be reinvested in terms of some of these long-term um, long solutions? We're almost out of time. Uh, unsurprisingly, the poll question about do you believe remote work will continue to be a feature of the workplace into the future? 100% um, of people said yes. I don't know if we've said this explicitly, maybe as a final comment, and please feel panellists to, to add to this in terms of any final reflections. Do you think completely flexible work will be a major part of the professional workforce in the future, or do you see it being a hybrid model? Tara or Adrian? Yeah, look, I'm... Um... I think, well, I, I hope it would be hybrid for the risks we've discussed tonight um, and, um, and the benefits as well. Yeah, I would hope it'd be hybrid. It's my, my mm. thought. I, I would agree with that. I, I suspect hybrid. And I also think that probably with some parameters around it. Um, and I think, you know, I know here at TAVCOS, we, we have a policy where people can work two days a week from home, but we prefer that they were regular days and that there's one day when everybody's in the office. So sort of doing things that meet the need of the organisation as well as the needs of the individual staff. Angela, did you have a final, a final comment? Um, no, look, I, I agree. I think hybrid is probably the way it will go. And, um, you know, that flexibility is a good thing. And I think, you know, this is one aspect, of course, of flexibility um, that we need to manage, um, which we're probably not, and that's another question in terms of the overall labour market when we think about gig workers and other types of flexibility. Um, but this is just adding to that, I think, where we are going to have a much more flexible labour market and we really need to think about, well, what are the systems underpinning that that we need so that people have security as well as flexibility? Um, because at the moment they're not quite working as well as they could, as an understatement. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. I mean, we've talked about equity in terms of individual workers' power uh, in the jobs market, um, the pay and security that they can, uh, they can achieve, but there also needs to be equity, doesn't there, around the process for negotiating um, what the future of work looks like that, you know, balances the the needs of employees of the particular role, but also you know, potentially employers as well. It's not something that can be mandated um, in detail by, 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 by government, and it really does need that, that holistic approach. I can see that we're almost out of, um, out of time. Um, thank you, panellists, um, for your time tonight and contributing to a really um, fascinating discussion. I think we've highlighted some of the issues, the need for ongoing um, research and really, you know, responsive, um, 
regulation and policies from government, but also strategies from employers and approaches um, from the community. I'm really pleased to, to say that colleagues from the um, business school here at the University of Tasmania, but across the university are certainly working on, on these issues and particularly how they're playing out um, here in Tasmania. Indeed, some of those colleagues will be involved in um, the subsequent discussions that I mentioned um, after Easter, looking at issues around skills and training um, in the post-COVID um, labour market and workforce. And then that question that we touched on tonight is having a deeper dive into some of the evidence and ideas around what it means for, for where we live and what it means for, for communities, commuting, office spaces, um, and tonight. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to draw to everyone's attention our next um, lecture or, or, or forum in the Island of Idea series is next week, looking at practical ways that we can reduce emissions and respond to the climate challenge that we're facing. Um, that's coming up and the information um, about that is obviously online. Um, then on behalf of uh, the university, the panel um, and the event staff at the University of Tasmania, um, thanks very much for being a part of tonight's conversation. Good night.